Hi everyone, it's Judy Warner. Welcome back to today's On Track podcast. Today we're joined by our friend Rick Hartley, who's going to talk about EMI noise control and why it's so hard to get under control in your designs. It's really a sneak peek of the full day class he's going to present at Altium Live October 9th through 11th. So lean in joy learning from Rick Hartley. Welcome to Altium's On Track podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, my dear friend, Rick Harley, it's always a joy to have you. Thank you so much for joining us on the On Track podcast today. Thank you. Well, since we've already done this a couple times on the podcast and the newsletter um, and all those I'm going to share in the show notes, by the way, in case any of our listeners have missed any of that good stuff, along with your keynote from last year's Altium Live, good. I thought a fun question, because I like the answer to this question, is what things in your childhood gave you clues that you would someday end up being an engineer? That's a really good question. Um, I think it started when I was five. I went out with my 10-year-old brother one day and his nine, 10-year-old friends. And we walked up and down the alleys of our neighborhood collecting useful trash from people's <laughs> trash cans. <laughs> and one of the things we found was a clock that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And my brother and I took it home and he took it apart and tried to get it to work and was unsuccessful. He gave up in about two minutes. Uh -huh. I stuck with that clock for two weeks. <laughs> and I never did get it to work. I mean, probably the mainspring was broken. It was a wind-up clock. Uh -huh. The mainspring was probably broken, and I was never going to get it to work. But I had my mind made up, I'm going to make this thing work. And, of course, it didn't happen, but I was five. Um, things like that happened through my entire childhood. I started fixing my own bicycles when I was seven, uh, you know, patching tires, repairing broken chains, replacing spokes, uh, putting new handlebars on, completely modifying the bicycle and, you know, big wheel in the front, small wheel in the back and doing all these crazy things. And I just grew up like that. And by the time I was 12, I was dabbling into radios, tearing those apart and figuring out how those work. Mm -hmm. And I was repairing all the appliances in our home by the time I was 14. So it was pretty obvious I was headed in this direction. It just, it was, to everybody in the family, boy yeah. is going to be an engineer. It's <laughs> so funny, the commonalities when I ask this question of different right. people. Um, ben Jordan, whom you know that works here, yes. same story. He, yes, oh, yeah, of course. You know, Eric radios. Bogerton, I'm sure, Lee Ritchie, all of them. All of them. And yeah, so well, I, I think it's so interesting to see which breadcrumbs kind of led you to the awareness yes. that you had the knack. You know, have yeah, you. The, oh, I, have you seen that cartoon? Yes, that cartoon oh, I love that thing. is that. so spot on. Oh, like, it is. I'm sorry, ma'am. He's got the knack. The knack. <laughs> I'm going to share that in the show notes, too. Oh, that's a good idea, too. Yeah, that's right? Because that is so classic. It is. Um, Beautiful. Um, yeah, it started with that alarm clock when I was five. And, you know, and Ben Jordan had told me that his older brother gave him a soldering iron for his to him for his seventh birthday. And he was obsessed with that thing. And I'm like, you know, today we would not give seven-year-old children soldering irons, but... Right. You know, both of us grew up in a different time where we, and by the way, I am not an engineer, but I did a lot of that stuff that you talked about. I fixed my own roller skates. WD-40 sure. was my best friend. I I modified the wheels on my bike. Even you though, may not be an engineer, <laughs> but you certainly have the knack. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. Um, yes, it I can see some of those breadcrumbs even in my own and Star Trek. I was obsessed with Star Trek. Oh, okay. Like, I have some of these qualities. Sure, I, uh, I can tell. It's funny. It's funny. It so, um, well, thanks for sharing that. I think it's always fun to see because 
they're always there, those indicators. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, some people don't find their path to what they're something really that they're really good at or really, you know, consumed by. Um, I think there's a quote by, I don't know if it's Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'm going to kill it. But basically he said, every man has an, uh, an orchestra or something inside of him, but most men die with their music still in them. Right. Mm. I don't find that to be true of engineers for the oh, most part. Not at all. They, it's like a consuming thing. So thanks for sharing. The other that. indicator was from the time I was in second or third grade, I never got less than an A or an A plus in math. Well, there you go. All the way through calculus and Laplace transforms, constant straight A's. So it was, it was obvious. That's funny. Yeah. I don't share that with you. But mm. but here's the other side. I'm a marketer now, right? Straight A's in English, straight A's uh, in anything written, creative, whatever. So it's... I, I, on the other hand, struggled to get through English without failing. Yeah. yeah. So there's where our brains do the little right. twist. Yes. Right. But, you know, somebody's got to host the podcast, Rick. There you go. <laughs> so... Um, well, I am delighted, delighted, delighted that you have agreed to uh, um, teach. Uh, last year at Altium Live 2018, um, you were a keynote speaker at Altium Live. And this year, um, I think most people were like, we want more of that Rick Hartley guy, right? And and could tell from your one hour keynote that you had lots more to share. So yeah. um, I'm delighted to announce here to our on track audience that Rick Hartley will be joining us in both San Diego and Frankfurt to give a full day class on EMI. The title of his class is Keys to Control Noise, Interference, and EMI in Printed Circuit Boards. So, um, I am so excited that you're going to do that, and I think that that um, the attendees will be the richer for it. So thanks I'm so excited much. Too. I'm I'm really excited you're going to join us. So why don't you talk a little bit about the background of that class and content, and sort of what is inspiring you to cover this topic in particular? Um, for me, it started in the 1980s. As you know, circuit boards back in the 60s and 70s and early 80s could be laid out. We've talked about this mm -hmm. any way you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. could do everything wrong and they still would work. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the mid 80s is when I started seeing issues where if we didn't grid power and ground on two layer boards, they wouldn't work. If we didn't have proper placement of decoupling, they wouldn't work. Those types of things started to come into play. And by the late 1980s, we were seeing a lot of problems in circuit boards. And, and not constantly, but about every second or third system we would design, we would have some sort of interference or EMI issue with it. Mm -hmm. And no one in our company really understood it. I, I had, as you know, a background of being in field service. And so that helped me a lot to help troubleshoot these problems. Right. But we didn't really solve them. We band-aided them. And we've mm -hmm. talked about this as well. We would put a ca capacitor or two or three here, here, or there, a couple inductors or ferrites, and we would eventually figure out a way, a gasket here, that sort of thing, to band-aid the product and get it to pass. And as I've said to you before, it's like having a nail in your foot and giving the patient crutches and pain meds to get by <laughs> rather than pulling the nail. And that's what we were doing. We were band-aiding problems. We weren't fixing them. And that, that obsessed me to find out why can't we seem to fix these problems? Why do we not understand what's going on? And that that is what drove me to start looking into this in the early 90s and really try to become keenly aware of the problems. And I think it was 1993 or four, <clears throat> maybe a little later, I went to PCB West the first time and I heard Lee Ritchie speak. And he keyed me a lot as well because he said things I'd been thinking about for a long time and didn't quite have the answers to. And he gave me that final little push over the edge that made me go, oh, I see now, yes. Uh, okay. And that really kicked me into high gear was listening to him. So that's kind of how I got to this point. And once I started to understand, 
we formed a designer council in, in central and southern Ohio, and we wanted I wanted to share this information uh -huh. with all my colleagues in that area. So I started teaching to the council, and then from the council it went to Apex, and then from Apex to there in PCB West, and it was first an hour, then two, then four, then a day, then three days, and then, you know, and it just keeps growing. <laughs> it's funny. I didn't know that exact trajectory of, of how you got sucked into the speaking and teaching side of it. Um, I thought it was fascinating and impressive, quite frankly, that the last time we talked, you told me that you dug so heavily into the subject that you bought and owned and read and sometimes multiple times over a hundred books on the subject of signal That's integrity. I and started buying them in the mid 80s. My first book was one by Henry Ott. The second book was one by Ralph Morrison. You know, and I have just continued from there. You know, what's funny is um, you you and some of the people you just mentioned have cited Henry Ott many times. And he popped up in my LinkedIn. I, I, I didn't even know if he was still alive. He popped up in my LinkedIn. So I sent him an invitation to connect the other day. And I said, you know... I know a lot of people who talk about you, Mr. Odd. I'd sure like to connect. So he's still um, bumping around, and so is Ralph Morrison. Actually, Dan Beaker's yes. been a big proponent of getting a website up and really honoring his work. So I love right. that. Um, before we move ahead, in addition to All Team Live in the class you're teaching there, um, can you talk about some of the other um, places you'll be speaking if people can't make it to All Team Live? Certainly. By the way, I'll plug the dates, October 9th through 11th on Coronado Bay. Like, I'm sorry, we have the best location. Oh, it's fabulous. It's a it beautiful, it's just overlooking the bay and it's absolutely glorious. So um, October 9th through 11th and um, Rick will be teaching all day on the 9th. And, and, you know, what I love is that you guys hang around and that our attendees, you know, you get to have conversations with a whole variety of people that are deep in the weeds on this subject matter. So right. anyways, I'm inviting you, our audience. But if you can't make it, Rick, where else are you speaking this year? Um, I will be, I have done two PCB two-day classes this year. Unfortunately, there are no more of those this year. I've done five over the last year and a half, and we've kind of for now, cut that off. There'll be more in 2020. Okay. Uh, PCB 2 day. In fact, the one day class I'm doing at Altium Live is uh, sort of an abbreviated version of the PCB 2 day. It's a lot of the same content. Not all of it, of course. It's a right. day. Right. It's a day instead of two. We're going to do right? a lot of the same content that's in that PCB 2 day. So that's something to look forward to in 2020. PCB West, of course, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, always comes up. And that's, I'm, I'm there every year. I've been there every year since the mid 90s. So uh, I will continue to teach there as long as they'll tolerate me. Yeah. Well, and amen to all that. If any of our listeners have not had the opportunity to go to PCP West, I cannot recommend it highly enough because people like Rick and other amazing – Rick – some of the other teachers, name some of them. So. Oh, Eric Bogatin is doing a half day on Monday. Mm -hmm. Lee Ritchie's doing a full day on Thursday. Susie Webb, uh, Gary Ferrari, uh, Mark Finstad talking about flex design. Just, I mean, there's the, the list. Oh, Dan Beaker. The list just goes on and on and on. There's this marvelous, marvelous there's... coming together of people with a vast amount of knowledge. And it's marvelous to go to. It, Dan it... Beaker has said many times mm -hmm. the first time he came to PCB West, he took my two day class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he started telling all of his Freescale customers after that. And this is when Freescale, and they still do, do a conference called FTF, Freescale Technology Forum. Mm -hmm. And he was telling people at Freescale Technology Forum, the best conference in the world you can go to is PCB West. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. It's just it, a It is as far as it brings everybody who's anybody together speaking over three or four days like and yes. and then on top of it um they of course will be there all team will be there we're gonna have a booth there so yes everybody pcb west mid-september this year and you know and again they pulled the supply chain in you know to the expo right. and all team will have a booth there um 
and we'll have a couple folks there doing demos or whatever and Ben will be there just giving a technical talk and I'll be there wandering around um, rubbing elbows with people like Rick Hartley <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I love that show so and um, okay so the PCB two days so yeah PCB West is really the, the, the next one coming up and then right on the heels of PCB West is Altium Live and right. again I always give this shout out and, and, and people are a little dubious of my uh intentions here but I always say it doesn't matter what tool you use you are welcome at Altium Live on day one on University Day we we kind of cut out all the Altium designer courses and put them on one day but the two-day summit it doesn't matter what tool you use it is right. just PCB design I and, agree. and and we pull in say a dozen or less um, exhibitors. So, you know, when we grow up, we want to be PCB West. We don't really. We, well, you're, he you're headed. I mean, you're doing a great job because, mm -hmm. I mean, you are doing a service in that you offer that day of training on Alcium Tools. But what's really interesting, I attended each, I attended multiple ones of those Altium based classes last year. Mm -hmm. And just the thoughts that were generated, doesn't matter what tool you're using, it still spurred me to think about well, what if I use this or that tool instead? Can I utilize those concepts? You know, so it's it's as much a matter of concept as it is tool. Yeah, which is... And, and of course, day one is it has nothing to do with Altium. It, it, I'll be doing that class on yeah. interference and noise control. Last year, it was Lee Ritchie doing a class. Right. And, and I'm also, sure next year you'll have another great we have um, also Gary Ferrari coming in to do a full day class on DFM. And who better to do that class? Gary's oh, absolutely. been around since forever and then um, there's the day of keynotes and other events of that type that is that was a wonderful day last year listening to the other three keynote speakers i had a ball i just had a ball it was great good i'm glad well thank you for the little plug because we really are trying to be of service to the pcb design community at large people end up buying our tools you know yeah. but meanwhile um it's just so needed for us to come together. You know, it's just so important that we have. So even though we are a tool manufacturer, I mean, a tool developer, we, we do want to include everybody. So yep. onward and upward. So let's talk about why this specific class you're teaching is important for designers today. What are the because dynamics that are going on today in the... You know what? Because we've talked about this before too. Everything's fast, and it is because rise times of IC outputs are fast. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best examples I ever saw of that in 2010, I was in Australia doing a, a two-day class um, at a conference, and a young gentleman came up to me and said, "I work for an elevator controller company, and we clock at 500 kilohertz at a half a megahertz." And we're having horrendous noise problems, interference problems, and EMI problems. And six months ago, we had no problems. We haven't changed a single thing in our system, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we're failing EMI, we're having interference issues. What's going on? And I said, if you sit and listen to the whole class, by the end of it, you will understand. It's about rise time. ICs keep mm -hmm. getting faster and faster and faster because they keep shrinking the die that the IC is on and as they do it creates shorter internal prop delays and all those types of things but it also makes the rise times faster. Faster rise time equates to higher frequency. So people are seeing, they, these guys were seeing three, four hundred megahertz EMI failures clocking at a half megahertz because the rise times were so fast, the high-end harmonic content was well up into the three, 400 megahertz region. Wow. And that's why people need to be concerned. Doesn't matter what your clock frequency is. Hmm. What matters is what devices do you use? Today, even microcontrollers, 8-bit micros, are causing problems for people. I mean, look at the automotive world. Dan talks about that all the time. All the time, yeah. Yes, and then one of the comments I heard him make recently in an interview was how most of his customers have told him that they design expecting to fail EMI testing. What? They don't expect to pass the first time. Think about that. 
people need classes like this if for no other reason to put away enough knowledge to be able to design to pass, not to fail. Well, if they're expecting to fail, then after they fail, what do they do? They do what we did back in the 80s. They what? play around and play around until they find the right right series of Band-Aids and penicillin and, you know, whatever else, pain meds. They figure out how to put enough Band-Aids on the thing to fix it. I uh, see this all the time. I did some work recently with a medical company that had an old product that had to undergo new new EMI standards that it didn't have to undergo when it was designed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It failed. And they asked me, short of redesigning it, what can we do? We ended up having to add some Band-Aids and put some gasketing inside the enclosure and a bunch of other stuff to stop the energy from getting out because they couldn't redesign it. If they did that, then they'd have to go through a whole other barrage of new tests. And we, we faced that in the avionics world as well. Oftentimes, our old products, we had to figure out ways to band-aid them if they had a problem because we couldn't redesign them because if we did, we had to go through a full bank of testing. FAA requirements, you redesign, you retest. Oh, boy. Yeah. And so people are faced with this constantly. And you also want to be able to design new products that don't fail, even though they have fast rise times. And that's why classes like this are so important. I think what surprises me about what you're saying, Rick, is how this is perpetuated for so many years and how you've been teaching Eric Bogutson, Lee Ritchie, you all have been teaching for a long time and why this message has not spread like wildfire and it isn't like mainstream adoption now. That's what that's what really puzzles me. You want to hear the funny part? There are people and I mean not just one or two who are well known in our industry, who deny the fact that fields matter as much as Dan and I and Ralph and others say they do. There are people who say it's still all about voltage and current. Oh, well. I have heard, I have heard some of these people say, you cut a trace, the circuit stops working. Well, I got news for you. We used to do RF designs where we would put a cut in the middle of a trace to add a series capacitor in the trace. That's what the cut did, is it created a small value capacitor and allowed only certain frequencies to pass on that transmission line. That's a typical RF design practice. My goodness. And people deny that it that it would work. Oh no, I got news for you folks, it works. That's Because crazy. the energy's in the fields and the fields travel in the dielectric. Um. You you were just you just um, said something about voltage, and you told me when we were on the call the other day that you heard a quote um, from a recent talk you attended where someone said, "There's no such thing as voltage." What? Correct. Yes, I know that that blew that blows people's minds. It was an IEEE event in Rockford, Illinois. The speaker was Dr. Bruce Archambault, and he basically said to the crowd of about 110, 20 people, maybe 130, quite a few. He said, a shocker for you, there really is no such thing as voltage. And there there were a few people nodding their head and smiling because they understood <laughs> what he meant. But most of the people there were like, really? Right. And what he went on to say, because the energy in a circuit is really in the fields, Voltage is actually the integral over some distance uh, over time of the E field, the electric field, times the distance that it travels. So it's the e, it's basically the integral of the E field. When we use a voltmeter or an oscilloscope mm-hmm. or any yeah. kind of piece of equipment yeah. to measure voltage, yeah. we're really measuring the E field. That's really what we're doing because that's where the energy, when a circuit starts to work, the first thing that appears in the circuit is the electric field. The electric field drives perpendicular to the trace and the plane, and it creates the current in both the trace and the plane. The current in turn creates the magnetic field, and those two fields contain the energy. Mm -hmm. And that's the way circuits actually work. 
So what's really amazing to me, Rick, is that you, Dan Beaker, Eric Bogdan, Lee Ritchie, you you all bang this drum of the energy it's in the field, right? And but that that's not perpetuated across the industry. Of course, it's not taught in university, which is not helping. But it just amazes me that that's where we are today when you guys have been teaching this since the 90s, at least, maybe longer. So it's just a weird state of affairs to me. But um, moving along, can you just breeze over a handful of topics that you're going to cover in your one day class at at Altium Live so our listeners will know what to expect. Absolutely. Okay. Um, basically, we're going to start out talking about the relationship between energy and noise. You know, how does noise get generated? How does circuit A interfere with circuit B? Why does this happen? And it really does come down to the design of the circuit board. Now, to go back to Henry Ott for a moment, I once heard Henry say, and I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember his exact quote. Mm-hmm. He said, Mr. and Ms. board designer, or circuit designer, sorry, you can create a perfect schematic. And Mr. and Ms. board designer, you can create a perfect circuit board. And the moment you populate the board with ICs, all bets are off. Because unfortunately, the IC world doesn't design correctly either. There are some ICs. Fortunately, I've been beating on this drum for a long time. And yeah. even Ben Beaker, who works at NXP, has been beating on this drum. Yeah for a long time that there are too many poorly designed ICs that are part of the problem. ICs are too small by themselves to cause radiation because they resonate at frequencies much higher than we test, but they can couple their energy into things on the board or Mm. in the package or connected to the board, which are capable of supporting radiation at the frequencies where we fail. So people don't realize the IC is the problem because they think, well, it's too small to be a problem. Very often it is the problem. So another of the things we're gonna talk about in this class is what to look for when you're selecting ICs. How should an Mm. IC be designed so so that the IC doesn't get you in trouble? Okay. That's something very key to understand. So we're mm-hmm. going to talk about energy's relationship to, to fields and, and the IC packages and board design. We're going to talk about the impact of frequency and how low and high frequency circuits behave differently. People talk about things operating in the tens of gigahertz being hard to design, and they are. There's no question about it. But the truth is stuff operating below 500 or 1,000 cycles are equally hard to design. Because low frequency energy behaves differently than high frequency energy. And I'm going to talk about why and what to do about it. I'm going to explain why these things happen and exactly what people can do at the board design level to prevent the problems. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to talk about lumped versus distributed circuits. When is a circuit long enough versus rise time that you have to do something with it, that you have to control its impedance, that you have to terminate it, that you have to pay attention to power delivery. You know, Eric Bogatin tells people, if you can breadboard a circuit with wire wrap wires and it works, you can lay it out any way you want to. The thing is, that's becoming harder and harder to do in today's world. Yeah. But it's true. If you can, if you can breadboard something with wire wrap, <clears throat> you can lay it out any way you want. But What do you have to do when you've gone beyond that point? We're going to discuss all of these things. We're going to get into some of the basics of grounding and grounding methods, especially things like return current paths, how to set up a board properly uh, to prevent problems. Ground, should you split it? If you have an analog and digital circuit on a board, Mm -hmm. should you split ground between them? The answer most people would react with is, oh, of course you should split them. And the right answer 99% of the time is no, don't split them. Yeah. There are times when you should, Mm -hmm. but most of the time you should not. So we're gonna discuss that and what to do about it. We're gonna talk about the keys to controlling common mode current, which is a leading cause of EMI. Uh, We're gonna talk a little bit about routing and termination styles of transmission lines to prevent reflections and signal integrity problems. I think most people today understand that topic reasonably well. So I'm Mm -hmm. only gonna spend limited time on it, Mm -hmm. but I am gonna discuss it briefly. We are also going to talk about basic component placement and the impact it can have on EMI. What, when placement causes EMI and when it helps control it. 
Mm -hmm. So things of that type. Uh, we're going to get into the extreme importance of I.O. connector placement and I.O. connector pinout. So important I can't even begin <laughs> to tell you. LCD displays are among the worst things I've ever seen in my life. 99% of LCD displays are have improperly pinned out connectors to connect them to the board. Wow. And the result is very often the LCD display and its connector and its cable are the problem. I've wow. seen that happen way too many times. I've because seen of pinouts. Because of pin out of the connector. That's correct. Wow. Uh, you can't even imagine how critically important. It's all about containing fields. Mm. And when we pin out connectors incorrectly, the fields are free to spread. And mm. as they spread, they couple into the wires of the cable. And as they do that, the cable resonates and radiates and creates a high frequency interference problem. Wow. So things like pin out. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about routing to control EMI. We're going to talk about, we're gonna, then we're going to get into power delivery and talk about things like the inductance of vias, planes, and capacitors, because that's critically important. Capacitor placement relative to via inductance. When I say that, people go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. The positions of capacitors affects via inductance. The answer is yes, it does. Wow. And that blows people away because they're like, well, how can that be? How yeah. can, but it's true. And we're going to discuss that as well. Um, decoupling boards that with routed power, a lot of the automotive and appliance industry does that. We'll get into four layer boards, six layer boards, eight layer boards, you know, how to route, how to, how to create proper power distribution on boards based on their stack up and also how to do it in very high layer count. You know, it's interesting. I want to pause you right there because I was talking to Lee Ritchie <laughs> recently. He was here at Altium and, um, I was saying, whatever, we were having a conversation about um, high-speed designs and, you know, things I wish Altium, you know, would do more on the simulation side. He goes, actually, Judy, it's more important today that you get your power distribution under control. That's where you should focus. That's right. And that's what you just said. <laughs> that's exactly what I just so, said. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. And, we do, and we, do have a, we do have a tool for that, but it, I can't remember if it only does... DC or something. I mean, we're still we're still I'm working. I'm familiar on... with the tool, and yes, it is designed to look for DC drops. It it looks for IR drops, and that's important. Yeah, we need to get the other half done. <laughs> oh, it's way beyond that. It's what happens at the frequencies of the rising and falling edges. I see. Because something a lot of people don't realize. Do you know how much time you have to deliver power from the power bus through the pins of the IC into the output stage? You have rise time, and that's it. Mm -hmm. The time of the signal rise is all the time you have to get that energy out of the power bus, through the IC, and into the transmission line. And if you don't do that cleanly, if there's too much inductance anywhere along the way, mm -hmm. and you get enough of a voltage drop to, mm -hmm. to impact power delivery, mm -hmm. you're toast. That's wild. You know, it is wild. Anyway, so from power delivery, then we're going to go into board stack, and I'm going to talk about some of the very same things I discussed in my keynote last year, but I'm going to take it further than the keynote yeah. did last year and get into all kinds of board stacks and the right way to do that. After that, we'll talk a little about IO filtering and then we'll close off the day talking about package design. Because as Henry Ott said, if you have a noisy IC, how do you stop that energy from getting out of the system? Part of it is proper package design. So we're going to discuss all of the entities needed to create quiet systems. Hmm. And that's what that's what the talk will be about. Sounds like gold. Thank so, you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here for those in our European office uh, European audience is that Rick will also be doing um, in addition to this full day class in Frankfurt um, he will also be a keynote speaker there for us, and thank you for that, Rick. Uh, can pleasure. you give us a brief overview of, of what you're going to do there, too? I'm, at, I'm really excited about this topic as well. Yes, I certainly can. Uh, basically, the keynote is going to be called What Your Differential Pairs Wish You Knew, and I'd like to thank you for that title. That's a wonderful <laughs> title. You, Judy came up with it, by the thank way. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> but it's true. Differential pairs don't behave the way a lot of people think they do. Most engineers whom I'm familiar with 
believe that a differential pair are two lines that reference each other, mm -hmm. when in fact that's not completely true. They reference each other at the receiver because the mm -hmm. receiver is a crossing detector that detects when one signal goes from high to low and the other one goes from low to high. Other than that, when you route them in a circuit board, they don't reference each other. They reference the plane just as single-ended signals would. Hmm. And so there's a lot of myths about how tightly differential lines have to be coupled and how uh, uh, long they have to be relative to one another to keep skew to a minimum. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these things are myths. I mean, for example, skew, circuit board materials, as you know, because you've been in this industry, are imperfect. <laughs> the glass to resin ratio at any spot on a circuit board is different than it will be an inch further down on the board. Mm -hmm. So the dielectric constant of the board relative to the transmission line changes as the transmission line moves through the board. And even two traces that are side by side don't see the same exact dielectric constant. As a result, they propagate at different rates. Yeah. So no matter how hard you try right. to match them in length, they won't end up being matched in length hmm. because the board itself will kick skew into the mix no matter how hard you try to make them the same length. And from a signal integrity standpoint, we actually have a lot more headroom for skew than people realize. Oh, um, well, that's interesting. I haven't heard yeah, that before. Most people don't know that. Where skew creates problems is EMI. Mm. But if, if skew is going to be a fact of life, no matter how tightly you match them, then you're going to have EMI from the differential pair no matter how tightly you match them. Well, what so, about now... Um, Lee Ritchie, and also I've talked to Chris Hunrath at Inst Electro about um, the advances they've made with spread glass and getting better results on the skew. And when you're dealing with very high frequency designs, yes, <clears throat> the, the spread glass and the skew issues are much, much improved. <clears throat> so it not only fixes, for example, Lee's doing the class that he's doing at PCB West mm -hmm. is on how to design systems with 32 gigabit lines. Yep. Which is fast. Yeah. At that speed, you better have almost perfect match in your lines mm -hmm. or skew mm -hmm. issues are going to eat you alive. Yep. Even at that frequency, you don't have to have perfect match from a signal integrity standpoint. You have to be tight, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And so this, these new glasses they're coming up with, new glass styles for mm -hmm. boards <clears throat> and some of the resins mm -hmm. together create boards that are much more consistent so that when you're designing it at 12 or 16 or 32 gigabits if you use these materials and if you use things like pre-emphasis or equalization when you're driving and receiving the transmission lines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all together that will help you get lines across the board and and off the board without skew problems that's but, wild i but for people using FR4 yeah, and lower yeah. end materials, there are people who do FR4 boards with differential pairs who think, well, if I match them perfectly, heck, I'm fine. They aren't. Hmm. So there's a lot of things about diff pairs that people don't realize that I want to try in an hour to present to them to give them something to chew on, to think about as they're moving forward. Well, this is pure gold to me. I'm so excited. Thank you again for sure, thank you. Thank agreeing. You. I mean, if we had you in Frankfurt, we might as well have your keynote too and right. teach the designer something else. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, we are about out of time. I wish we could talk for another hour because I know you have so much wisdom <laughs> to share, but I'll save all your goodies for Altium Live. And again, to our listeners, uh, I think we're opening registration today or tomorrow I don't know soon um, yeah. for all team live but you don't want to miss um, the great talks by by uh, Rick Hartley and again October 9th will be his full day class and I personally invite you to join us and and furthermore besides listening to Rick's talk you can hang out with Rick and have a beer and bang your head on the wall and say why won't my circuit work and Rick will 
help you solve your problems. So that's always a fun time too. So may I ask you a question? Yes. Who are the other keynotes at Altium Live? And who are the keynotes at Altium Live in San Diego? We have a really neat lineup this year. Um, so we have Eric Bogatin, of Good. course. So yep. um, people in there, uh, actually people ask for both you and Eric to come back after last year. So okay. yay, mission accomplished. Um, we also have um, Robert Ferranic. I don't know okay. if you know Robert. Um, I know of him. Yeah. So he's got a big YouTube following. He does a lot of training on either Altium Designer. He also uses Cadence, but just teaches uh, PCB design. At two, I think he has 25,000 wow. subscribers on YouTube. He's had millions of downloads of his content. So he he's done. He went out and did a ton of research on... Um, how a variety of size of design teams and companies about their design process. How do they handle libraries? How do they handle documentation packages? And right. it, we've done a pot, we just did a podcast with him and he said that he thought he was going to get one answer, like the magic bullet. <laughs> of course he didn't, but he's right. going to present sort of a uh, menu of, you know, his takeaways from interviewing all these companies. So that's going to be very exciting. Well, that's great. I that's know. True. So, um, and then we have Joe Grand. Joe Grand owns Grand Idea Studios. He's really a hacker. And what he does, you know, and is paid for his, you know, main job, he owns Grand Idea Studio. And he is a, a white hat hacker, they would say. So he'll get contracted by military companies and he will expose their their vulnerabilities oh nice to hacking that's oh that's really cool i like that and so he's always been sort of this hacker but he deals with really high-end companies now but he's doing a talk about like think like a hacker in your professional engineering like where are you leaving vulnerabilities you know things right. like that he also this is really fun he also was a co-host him and five of his engineering buddies they um got a contract with discovery channel to create a show that was on for three seasons or so called prototype this mm -hmm. oh, oh my gosh rick you have to look it up it's so fun so they would come up with some really wild wacky idea and prototype it in a really small period right. of time like a truck that drives you know has like some kind of hoist and it drives over the top of traffic or it'll park <laughs> over a top of another car it's yeah I've, I've seen something on that yeah recently that's interesting so he's one of the co-hosts of prototype this and nice. so and he's also the original founder of badge life so he makes these mm. badges for defcon every year they're it's very elaborate so he really started the badge life movement as well so it's really a not not one of our typical you know people we'd see in this kind of conference but i think he right. has a lot to to um teach oh, it sounds like it yeah and then the last one we're going to have is bob martin who is with microchip and Bob mm. is called the Wizard of Make. That's his, his um, sort of nickname. Yeah. But he's going to show people how to... Uh, Microchip now owns Arduino. Mm. Well, and yes. Bob used to be with Amtel. So he has a kind of unique, like, how do you prototype, you know, using Arduino and, you know, doing proof of concept and how you can sort of take advantage of stuff that's already half built for you right and nice. and that is great. learn to get prototypes done so it's a really interesting mix it's not of course you and eric are sort of our you know bread and butter the ones we hope and expect but i think these two will add a really interesting um, oh i think they'll be great i'm really anxious to hear them that's terrific yeah so it's thanks for asking the question so um, and we will hopefully have them on the podcast here shortly and we can share more about, they can share more about what their topics are. So it's going to be in, it's going to be a neat bag of tricks. So Good. Um, Rick, can't thank you enough again for 
just your friendship and your wisdom and sharing it with the industry. And thanks so much for joining us. And My pleasure. Thank you to our audience for listening today. We hope you've enjoyed all the wisdom of Rick Hartley. We hope you'll join us at uh, Altium Live. We look forward to being with you next time. Please like, subscribe, and tell us what you want to learn about so we can um, pull in sharp people to, to help do your job better. So thanks again for joining. Until next time, remember to always stay on track. Oh.